Appendix Of the land of Charis, its form, nature, and climate, and of its peoples and their several histories, such as are set forth in that volume of the Winter Chronicles called the Book of the Arm Ring. In reducing to a single tale the long span of years covered in the Book of the Arm Ring, the many strands of lives and events that weave and intertwine throughout the many details of people and places, much has had to be omitted or told only from afar. For it was a mastersmith, Elof Valentor, who proved, unknown even to himself, to be the prime mover in that troubled time, and his tale is the one that matters most. Also, as before, the authors of the Chronicles could scarcely help writing for their own times and their own folk, so inevitably they leave much unexplained that we no longer know, or explain at length matters we would today take for granted. This account cannot replace all that is missing, or has had to be curtailed, but it may at least paint in more detail the backdrop, like a remote and misty landscape against which these events took place. The Land The land of Charis, with which the Book of the Arm Ring is principally concerned, was like no other in the world at that time, uniquely suited to provide a refuge for men against the ravages of the long winter, and a fit cradle for the birth of a great civilization. In form, it was as Elof and Rock saw it, a river valley of immense size. In extent, it must have been greater even than they realized, stretching at its widest some six or seven hundred leagues from the western oceans to its eastern margins, and from north to south over two hundred leagues at its widest. In former days, when it also included great regions of the hinterlands above its northern and southern walls, its area can only be guessed at. But these were gradually lost to the ice and to the desert that crept relentlessly northward, like its malign shadow. By the time of Elof's arrival, the last of them had become the wild lands, home to none save the scattered remnants of the Durgar. The account given by Elof of the origin of Karis is substantially correct. However, it had gone through many such changes before. Originally, it appears to have been a low-lying, landlocked basin, probably a barren desert, founded upon rock chiefly of granite and limestone types. It was held back from the oceans by a land barrier at its eastern end. Gradually, this was eroded away, until at last the seas came flooding in and over in a waterfall of astonishing size and height. This probably created the ridge upon which the gate was built. The shape depicted on surviving marginal sketches, though obviously much narrowed and steepened on its seaward side by men to make a defense, still suggests a shallow crescent typical of wide falls such as Niagara, or the awesome rock face long dry at Malham Cove in Yorkshire, England. The waters that poured over that fall turned the basin into an inland sea, but in this succession of long winters launched against the living world, enchaining more and more of the world's waters, its level sank and it became land once more, only to rise again as each winter came to its end. This the Duergar seemed to have known, but among men, more recent arrivals, it was either never realized or wholly forgotten. These successive floodings were not without their, without their effect on the once infertile land. The waters had eroded much hard rock to sand, and into this inflowing rivers, as well as diluting the salt content, poured rich loads of upland silt, fertile volcanic debris distributed by the waters into which it fell, may also have played a part. As the level of the seas outside gradually declined, the waters drew back and left these deposits open to the air. Land plants came to grow on this new soil, found it, 
and enriched it with their remains, and after them trees and animals, establishing a whole fertile cycle. Certainly the results, by the time men first came there, was a black alluvial soil of remarkable richness, and on the higher ground, brown earths of the podzol type. Developed under the vast tracts of deciduous forest, which then covered the land. In the more southerly areas, the less fertile Terra Rosa soils formed on limestone. By later days, however, the richest soils had been exhausted by over-farming, and the forests cleared altogether from much of the land. The unity of the soil was destroyed, and much of it was simply blown or washed away. Even before its drowning, Karis, rich as it seemed, was a dying land. The Great River So it was that Karis was, in a very real sense, created by the river, and the river continued to dominate it, as the name the Penruthia, or Southern people, gave it, Yeskienis, acknowledged. Kien was a rather poetic name for a vein, and so this meant vein of the heartland, or as it was understood, river at the heart of the world. The Svarhoth, inhabiting the north of the land, took a less central view and called it simply My Plastavathian, the Great River. As sea levels had declined, so the falls over the ancient barrier had ceased to flow, save for a small central cranny or channel that the river cut itself, probably by following some crack or flaw in the eroded rock or some softer intrusion. This admitted a relatively restricted flow of seawater, but it was soon swelled and its salt diluted by inflows from various tributaries to north and south. Some of these were created or swelled by meltwater directly from the ice, and this brought with it the same terrors as did the upper reaches of the Gorlefros to the marshlands in Nordney. But the great river dispersed these in its vastness as it rode peaceably through the center of the land, and in some trace of darker influence remained, a slow poison for the mind and spirits of the people, it cannot now be said. Past the warm lands where men founded Karis, the river flowed, until at last it broadened to become a great lake, more properly, an inland sea. Those waters were little navigated or frequented. The lands around the, their shores were hot and unwelcoming when men first arrived there, with many regions of marsh along the coasts, and tempted nobody to settle save the most desperate of outlaws. By Nathade's time, thousands of years later, the marshes had spread, and the rest degenerated into barrens in the north and near desert in the south. Through those marshes, along many small streams and channels, the waters of the Yeskianis drained southward, and though much was lost by sheer evaporation, at least one river was thought to reach the mysterious oceans to the south. But it was not navigable, and its course, if it ever was known, had long been lost. Adventurers in those lands had brought back little of worth, but many plagues and spreading maladies, until the reputation of the area for disease was such that landing there was forbidden on pain of death. If any ventured it, therefore, they left no records and no certain maps have survived. The High Gate Such was the course of the great river, and a vein it was indeed to the land, and the ships that carried their produce to feed the great city at its heart, and at need their soldiers to enforce its defense and royal authority, that so many of their towns were built along its shores and at its confluences is ample witness of this. Its importance was obvious to the people of the land, even from the earliest years. Very soon, they began building over that narrow crevices in the ancient barrier and the falls that came through it, the first stages of what was to become the High Gate. 
They had many reasons for sitting such a fortress there. But high among them was the desire to protect the source of the river that was their land's life. At that time, they had not yet grown complacent and lost their awareness of what the ice or some other enemy might do. Generation after generation built the gate higher and grander, and as the sea level fell outside, they cut down and narrowed the ancient barrier into a well too steep for any enemy to scale. In the end, the gate towered high over the ancient ridge, an imposing palace atop walls smooth and utterly unscalable, guarding the river that thundered through its depths, and it became a sign in the minds of men, a symbol of the fountainhead of the land they loved. A fire was set on its roof, guiding mariners by day with its smoke and by night with its flame, and to them, in particular, it became an almost sacred sight, their last upon setting sail, and their first upon their return. Since it was the greatest and most adventurous mariners who discovered the new lands across the ocean, it became especially important to them, and for those who fled into exile to found a new realm there, it was a poignant memory, the last they were ever to see of Charis. So it was that even when, with the decline of Charis, the gate had ceased to mean so much to its people, their kin beyond the seas were still invoking its name. Climes The compression of climes that the long winter created throughout the world was particularly acute in Charis at the time of Elof's coming. This was because the ice had been able to distribute itself very differently than in Bracehall. To onlookers such as Elof and Rock, the great ice sheets appeared at first to have extended far further south, but in fact the borders of the main sheets followed much the same parallel as across the oceans. What they had been able to do, however, was create an advance guard of secondary ice sheets by the means Ansker described in the Book of the Swords, colonizing the heights of more southerly mountain ranges by extending, by extending glaciations from mountain snow caps. The land immediately beyond the main ice sheets had no such peaks, but was hilly and uneven enough to impede their advance. It became the tundra landscape of Taunla, snowy, bleak, and haunted, an evil place in whose northern reaches nothing save the hardiest lichens could survive. Over this, however, cold airs and subtler influences spread to the mountain peaks beyond. Gradually, their ice caps swelled and gathered strength and gave birth to glaciers that flowed down below the snow lines, joined and became vast enveloping ice sheets that no longer changed with the seasons, but were as permanent as the main body of the ice. In fact, it was the ice glow from these, and not from the main body, that Elof and Rock saw from Elon Gorhainen. There were now two of them, each the size of a substantial country, and steadily growing by the same process. Each winter, the cold fingers of the glaciers would spread further along the more southerly peaks and leave them that fraction colder. And though with the thaw they would retreat again, it would not be all the way. Each year they had gained a little more ground, until now in winter they thrust deep into what had been the north of Karis and spun their webs of frost and snow over valleys that had once been high green pastures, home to hardy farmers of the Svarhof folk. Now they were miserable barons, and even when the snow had drawn back, many evils stalked them under the shadow of those peaks. South of these troubled lands, the land was still fertile and rich, though it suffered from severe winters that killed off a great part of its game. Once, it had been the main home of the Svarhof, who were for the most part 
free landholders and cultivators, save when they lived by the sea. Then it had held their pastures and grain fields, for they raised both, and many other crops besides. There had even been orchards for the more robust fruits, and a few vineyards on the most southerly slopes. But most of that people had fled the advance of the ice thousands of years since. And now these were the wild lands, overgrown and tangled, home only to the Duergar and human outlaws and much feared on that account. From time to time, under some more vigorous king attempts, had been made to clear and resettle parts of them. But in winter, these little colonies were isolated for long periods, and sooner or later, they came to a bad and mysterious end. Many blamed the Duergar rather than the ice, and it is not impossible that they were right. But to the people of the Vale, its steep sides, in many places impassable cliffs, remained an effective barrier against the worsening conditions above. And for centuries, this seemed to be so. In their shelter, the land north of the Great River enjoyed a warm, temperate climate, growing gradually warmer as the river angled away to the southeast. The lands of the southern shore were much the same in the regions about the gate, but as they sloped away sharply southward, they grew increasingly warm and humid, basking in a warmth semi-tropical and even fully tropical with high humidity. A great belt of dense rainforest covered the southernmost slopes of the Vale and extended out to envelop the southern mountains. Beyond these, however, the land grew equally swiftly hot and dry and the forest gave way to parched scrubland, sun-baked barrens, and at last sheer desert. And though it was hardly noticeable at first, this too was advancing, as the ice drained more and more of the free water from the cycle of life, and bound it in chill and sterile chains. Thus the extremes of climb that had first brought Karis into being were all the millennia of its existence closing upon it like the jaws of a nutcracker, and all the while the shell was growing rotten from within. The Last Winter This was the closing of the jaws, the disordering of climes in whose fell grip the fleets of Morvanic found Karis. It began soon after Nathade's death and Elof's flight, as if either or both of them had been holding it somehow at bay. And this may be the case. It started as an early, fierce autumn, with stormy rains that ruined the harvest, and frosty nights that froze the sodden ground hard. Bitter blasts whipped the southern forests, blowing ever more of their tenuous topsoil from the great areas that man had cleared for his own husbandry or simply laid waste. The first snows for thousands of years fell there, and the plants shriveled. In the north, the snows fell heavier, and the river began to slow and freeze. Then at last men saw their folly in neglecting the gate, and cursed the Launuan line that had let it slip from their grasp. Somehow men managed to survive the winter, though food was scarce and many dark perils stalked the land, eagerly awaiting the spring, and some kind of thaw. But the time came, and there was no saw, thaw. The snows did not slacken, nor did the glaciers relinquish their hold upon the mountains high above the walls. I stopped the inflow of the great river at last, and its level began to fall. What was happening to the northward can only be guessed at, but it is likely that the main body of the ice was beginning its long-delayed advance at last, and setting in motion the final stages of Lohi's plan. Certainly, the hilly tundra was more densely covered in snow than ever before. With the weather so propitious, in a very short time, weeks or days even, 
it might be about to form a solid sheet and allow the main body to reach and merge with its two offshoots, and they in turn to stretch forward and join up with the enclave of ice around the gate, where Lohi was exerting her own power. From there, the path of the ice would have been easy and obvious, down the great river and into the heart of Karis. Formerly, its sheer size must have made it almost impossible to freeze, keeping a constant temperature in its depths, and also its salinity. Ever since its flow had been reduced at the gate falls, however, only its tributaries were feeding it, and it had been growing fresher. This may explain the dearth of fish Elof found around the island. Now, with many of the northern tributaries themselves frozen, it was also dwindling in size, already half frozen. With the ice itself behind her, she could undoubtedly transform it almost at a stroke from river to glacier, from a bearer of life to a harbinger of death, overwhelming a vast area of land. Whether this in itself would have been enough to overturn the climactic balance of the world and make the ice permanent, we cannot now tell. But from the urgency all the powers seem to have sensed, it almost certainly was the crucial point. As to what brought this about? The Chronicles offer no better explanations than Elof's, and they seem to be right. Recent research suggests that the forces he saw at work would indeed have produced the results he feared, and ironically, it is from the ice sheets that the evidence comes. The Antarctic ice cap preserves a remarkable record of many atmospheric events and changes, and among these are any particularly great volcanic eruptions. These hurl vast amounts of dust and gases, in particular sulfur dioxide, high into the atmosphere. And it is this gas, converted to fine droplets of sulfuric acid, that the ice preserves. Comparing concentrations of this in ice of known age with records of climactic changes over the same period have produced remarkable correlations between, for example, the enormous eruption of Tambora in Indonesia and the extraordinarily severe weather in the northern hemisphere in the first centuries of in the first years of the 19th century known significantly as the little ice age studies of later eruptions when more accurate records exist such as Krakatoa in 1883 or more recently Mount St Helens establish that the temperature not only of the particular region but of the Earth as a whole, falls by several tenths of a degree in the years following a major eruption, chiefly because of the filtration effect of the dust in the upper atmosphere upon received solar radiation. Most of that dust falls to the Earth in only a few days, but enough remains to make, significant, to make a significant difference. The effect of a number of such active volcanoes over a period of many years capped at the climax by a period of extra-violent eruptions, and in a restricted area where the ice could at least strongly influence wind patterns to gather and sustain more dust than usual, is difficult wholly to imagine. It would certainly be savage, turning the sky to a permanent luring gray, chilling the air, and stifling photosynthesis in plants. A sudden glaciation of the river might well increase the volcanism still further, but even without that, it would have been quite conclusive enough for Lohi's needs. The Peoples The People of Karis It is accurate to say people, for the division between Svarhoth and Penruthia, northerner and southern, that so bedeviled the Westlands had always mattered less in Karis, and by the time of Elof's coming was almost extinct. Nevertheless, it had its roots there, and they helped to understand its history. Originally, 
it may have reflected the merging of two distinct peoples. Relics, perhaps, of the forgotten racial strands in the little kingdoms of the north before the ice came, and that now were less than legendary. Kingdom, indeed, may have been too grand a word. More probably, most were mere tribal leagues as loose as the Ekwesh, and at best small and fluid monarchies of various kinds like Northumberland or Mercia in Dark Age England, or the Burgundian and Frankish realms that grew up around the Roman Empire. Almost certainly the dominant kingdom among the Penruthia was a city-state, because it was a central mold they never escaped, but simply expanded to fit the land. Even in so vast a realm as Charis, which had perforce to have several great cities, one immense community dominated all the rest. The Svarhof never showed quite the same tendency. Their preference was always for towns of moderate size among a loose federation of villages. Probably it was the threat of the ice that first drove these related but disparate peoples to unite. But nothing, is certain, but nothing certain is known of that. It is well established, however, that in even the earliest records of Charis, they thought of themselves as one nation, owing allegiance to one lord, intermarrying freely, and speaking one another's tongues. It was chiefly a preference for different climes and manners of life that kept them separate at all, and perhaps also kept them friendly for they seldom, if ever, completed, competed for the same land. The character of both peoples was much the same as in the realms of Bracehall. The Penruthia of Charis were always a more numerous race, probably because their way of life allowed it. They were a lowland folk, fond of warm climes and the vast, rich farmland of rivering plains. They grew much grain and many orchards and vineyards but raised little meat or dairy produce, and almost no fish. Their lands tended to be divided into large estates, whose farms were held in tenancy from the great lords. But this tenancy was not a burdensome thing, and until the last years the land was worked at all levels by free men. Some of the estates on the southern shore, settled later, were of astonishing size. Their laborers numbered by the thousand, and their lords, men of great consequence. Their sh cities showed the same tendency toward size, but in a well-ordered form. They were masters of buildings, as of all the other arts, and had a surprising command of the basic requirements in water supply and sanitation that alone made such communities practicable. Their laws regarding public health were strict and carried severe penalties. And they were supported by all levels of the community, even the lowest. Almost certainly this was a result of the state's provision of basic instruction for all its citizens. What was provided varied wildly. But in Karis the city, at its height, there was almost no citizen of sound mind who could not read and write and recite the basic table of laws. The Penruthia had a strong tradition of hierarchy and the rule of law from above, but set against this an equally strong tradition of freedom, if not of equality, for all men. This often took the form of opposition to their kings, commonly by powerful lords in pursuit of their own independence. The Svarhof, on the other hand, had no particular tradition of order, and few, if any, great lords. They reserved their respect of wise elders and rich men, and regarded the king much as a clan might its chieftain, their ruler, but by right of kinship more than law. They chose to dwell chiefly among the cooler uplands above the northern walls of Karis Vale, a land that seemed far too coarse and wild to the Penruthia but could in fact yield a rich living to men who knew how to cultivate it. They grew some grain, wine grapes, and other fruit in the sheltered valleys, but meat and dairying were their main products, 
Upon hill and mountain pastures they raised their huge cattle, and upon higher slopes of coarser vegetation sheep or goats. Wise in all matters relating to ships and seafaring, they fished not only the rivers, but also the rich seas around the coast. They also thrived upon forestry and hunting, for they took better care of their wooden lands than did the southrons. Land holdings were mostly no larger than an individual could manage. Even the richest men might own no more than a single manorial farm, albeit a very large one, and some woods and hunting preserves. Tenancy was almost unknown and treated with deep suspicion. Some villages, however, owned and worked large holdings in common, and so also some families, for a particular reason. Land was inherited not by the eldest male heir, as with the Penruthia, but by all the sons jointly. Only if it could not support them all would some have to seek their support elsewhere. Since large families were rare among the Svarhoth, this usually worked well enough. There were plenty of opportunities for such sons. Shipping and the crafts were honorable and prosperous occupations that supported many, and also matters financially and scholarly. The Penruthia appeared to dominate trade, but never to the exclusion of an energetic northerner. Indeed, since it was Svarhoth-owned ships that handled the cream of the swift river traffic, they had considerable influence in it, and many a southern lord owed his fortune to the acumen and industry of his Svarhoth stewards. And in scholarship and statecraft, which they tended to associate, both strains mingled readily, the Penruthia excelling only by their numbers. In general, this union of peoples was a strong one, each fulfilling somewhat different roles, each benefiting from what the other lacked and respecting the other for it. It was a strong foundation upon which to build such a realm. Such friction as there was appeared to have been mild, easily contained by the Yasmarian kings who mingled the blood of both races. And it is noticeable that when serious factional problems did break out in Karis, the division was more social than racial. The plebeian and patrician factions that appeared among the Penruthia were reflected among the northerners, though less aggressively. But then the distinctions between lord and commoner were never so important there. The factions plagued the land, but never seriously divided it. The real difficulties began when the might and wealth of Karis were at their peak, and the land seemed a strength unassailable. It was then the menace of the ice first began to make itself felt among the Svarhoth lands, and the remotest northerners had to flee southwards, even into the Vale. Then, a generation later, a serious conflict of kinship and succession broke out for the first time among the Ismarian. The Sundering of the Peoples The details are simple enough. A king, Garanen, died, leaving a son and a daughter by different wives. The laws of succession were strict. Daughters could inherit at need, but the son, Barak, was the elder, and there was never any doubt that he would be the rightful successor but he died within days of his father. And though he was of mature years, and his wife had recently borne him a son, there was grave doubts as to whether the child, though named for him, was in fact his, and what followed fed that doubt. His widow, Amur, immediately instilled as regent, not Beric's younger sister, Alte, as was customary, but their cousin, Dormade, one of the most able and powerful southern lords. By a coincidence of ancestry, he was a pure-blooded Yasmarian, a well-made man of great charm and vigor, and he was also a former suitor of Amur. 
the resultant Führer threatened to split the country, for if the child was not Berex, then Alte was the rightful heir, and after her, her son Karen. But Dormade enjoyed great support among powerful men of both Penruthia and Svarhoth, and of both ancestral factions. Fewer supported Althea, young widow of a Yasmerian landholder and of no great distinction, but she showed great firmness in claiming the throne on behalf of her son. For many years the whole land simmered, without ever quite bursting into the flame of civil war. Even the ancestral factions were split down the middle, although the older aristocracy tended to support Althea and the newer Dormade. Dormade was the effective ruler, but his power was never absolute enough to put down his enemies, and to do him justice, he had no particular wish to, restraining the most hot-headed of his followers. It was charged he had murdered Barak, but his later behavior made this less likely. Althea was less restrained, but could never whip up enough sure support. However, her supporters' minor insurrections seriously disrupted the trade of the land and deepened divisions. When the garrison of the High Gate declared for her, she occupied it and set up her own court there, and over a period of years intrigued to little effect against Dormade. Meanwhile, the two children were growing up, the younger Barek as a powerless shadow under Dormade's overwhelming personality, and Karen as an independent and intelligent young prince. As he grew up, it became obvious that he was the most attractive character in the whole tangle. When he reached his first manhood, in his sixteenth year as was custom, as the custom then was, his mother was persuaded to hand over her claim to him, and swiftly he gained greater support than she ever had. Dermade himself, eager to end the disruption, offered him joint succession with Barak. But Barak, for the first time in his life, objected violently. He threatened Karen's life, and swore bloody retribution against the least man who supported him. Civil war now began to seem inevitable when Dormade died, if not sooner, and men on either side began to arm and prepare, and break off what slight contact they had kept with their opponents. Towns on one side or the other hounded out minorities lest they launch a surprise attack, and murders and brawls began to multiply. This prospect, on top of the years of squabbling he had known, saddened and disgusted Karen, and the news of the advancing ice brought by the northern refugees, remote as it seemed to most, filled this far-sighted prince with alarm for the future. He was in the mood to find some new alternative when one presented itself. Mariners had long suspected the existence of another land across the oceans. Wide-ranging fishermen claimed to have fished off its shores, though none had dared to land. Now, some bold Svarhoth shipowners, desperate for new profits after some fourteen years of decaying trade, set out to find it in earnest. One part succeeded, after great privations, and returned to tell of a vast new land of forests and high mountains, wild and uninhabited, as far as they could tell, but fertile and full of promise. Most significantly of all, it was relatively untroubled by the ice. For Karen, that was enough, and he resolved to seek out a new home in this land. To Dormade and Barek, he sent a defiant challenge, saying that though he asserted his birthright still, he preferred to extend his realm rather than let it rather than lay it waste with war, and since the folk must be divided, let those who favored his cause come with him to settle this new land. Dormade would not hinder any who wished to go, but would assist them with ships and resources then 
rightfully or not, he might rule those who remained. Dermate accepted this with relief, for he too hated the prospect of war. He ignored the wrath of Berek, who foresaw, rightfully, that many would desert the land rather than face his rule, shrinking his inheritance and injuring his pride. In fact, many even among his own supporters were piqued by the idea and the taste of adventure, and the number who responded surprised even Karen. Men and women of every quality, of every allegiance and faction joined with him. Until the size of the expedition began to alarm Dormade. But by then, events had gathered momentum, and there was little he could do. Berek's attempts to deter recruits by threatening the kin they were leaving behind simply swelled their numbers further, as he might have expected, and led to open conflict between Dormade and himself. In the end, some five years later, it is said that more than a fifth of the entire Penruthia population of Karis chose to follow Karen, and close to half the Svarhof. And the majority of these were able-bodied folk in their prime years, so that the loss of the land was far greater. Many more would have come, if they could have hoped to survive the voyage. More ships were needed than the land could possibly dispose of, and it may well be that the great clearing of forests began at this time, and that the timber taken was never fully replanted. There is no reason to doubt the Chronicle's picture of the fleet at last assembled on the shores, below the gate, darkening the ocean and stilling its waves by the very number of its hulls. The number of people who sailed in them is harder to be sure of, but since at that time Karis was mightier and better peopled than, than when Elof and Rock came there, it is possible that a hundred thousand at least set sail with Karen that day, and like him, looked their last upon the beacon of the gate until even its last wisp of smoke had vanished utterly beneath the remorseless horizon. It was a blow from which, perhaps, Karis never quite recovered. Soon after the sailing, Berek, supported by many who were suffering his consequences, raised a rebellion against Dormade and toppled him. He became king, and his heirs after him, and save for one act of cruelty, he was not as bad a ruler as his beginning had promised. His, fault, his worst fault was a certain weakness and indecision, which had perhaps been seen in Dormade also and inability to restrain the warring factions. Yet it is not unlikely that he did indeed represent some altered strain in the Ismarian. For though after him, as before, there were kings strong and weak, good and less good, that indecisive nature appeared more and more often, till in the end the kings were reduced to puppets of their powerful warlords and marshals, and were at the last overthrown by one such of the Lonyun line, who took their place, and his great-grandson was Nathaid. That act of cruelty was significant. It is said that Berek took Dormade to the shore and mockingly sent the defeated regent and a few close companions to sea in an ill-equipped hulk, bidding them also seek new kingdoms to conquer. Cruel as this was to a man very likely his own father, it is possible to understand the grievance he bore. The land was cruelly impoverished by losing so many, and the nature of its people changed. The Svarhof, in particular, dwindled from that time, becoming a far smaller adjunct to the Penruthia than they were anywhere in the new land save only Kerberhain. And without them, as Elof suspected, Karis began to follow the same downward slope. Together, both strains added up to a great people, but with their mutual influence removed, each followed their own particular downward paths into harsh and demoralized decadence or sullen rusticity, respectively. Clearly, some more radically blending was needed in them both, and it may be that it was this, Arch as it seemed, 
the downfall of all their lands and the ending of the long winter provided. Of the fortunes of the folk of Karis, in its immediate aftermath, a little is known. For one or two fortunate ships still managed to escape across the oceans to Morvenhall in the years that followed. Relatively few lives were lost. From the wake of that unnatural winter, a sudden and balmy summer followed, and a sudden explosion of growth. The wild lands, to which most in the north had escaped, took flower and fruited, and rough patches could be cleared and sown here and there, and shelters built against the coming winter. In the south, the jungle also provided some food. So few, if any, starved. But the life they clung to was hard, with hardly a trace of its former luxury, or even of civilization. The Duergar might have helped, fallen as they too were, but the gulf between them and men was grown too wide. Objects of fear they were and remained to the sundered folk. Of the north, the last that was heard, a generation later, spoke of a reversion to the levels of the Stone Age, and of the south, nothing. In so short a time was the glory of that land brought at last to the dust. Yet against the span of time, even all the millennia of its rise and fall seem little longer and are swallowed up in that great river so thoroughly that they might as well never have been. Languages The tongues of Karis were, like its peoples, very close to those of their kin in Bracehall, and more has been said of these in earlier appendices. However, they were less close than they would appear from the texts of the Chronicles suggest and it is likely that Rock and Elof had a great deal more trouble making themselves understood than the accounts suggest. The grammar of both versions of Penruthia appears to have remained substantially intact over the long period of their separation, but such matters as word termination had altered drastically, and even the meanings of many common words. The accents also had changed. Rock had the advantage here, for Elof's clear northern accents sounded alien to the Penruthia, though not unpleasant, and startlingly august to northerners such as Trikgar. It was as if an Englishman of today were addressed by a fine speaker of Shakespeare's English. The northern tongue had changed less, for its speakers had become an extreme minority, and as minorities do, they guarded their tongue jealously hugging it close to them and teaching and using it with meticulous care. Arcane Beliefs and Arts Of these, also much else has been said earlier, but some points arise only in the Book of the Arm Ring. In Karis, for example, the probable origin of the river as a concept of time and the cycles of the world, and as a border and barrier to the land of the dead, are best seen, for to the first men who looked upon it, that awesome flow must have seemed like the bounds of the world indeed. At some later date, though, the Milky Way seems to have become identified with the metaphysical river and been given the same name. But by Kermorban's day, it was no longer seriously thought of in that sense, save by the least educated of folk and the river had become a wholly philosophical concept. Yet nevertheless, that misty streak across the night skies persisted as a symbol of potent meaning, at least as significant as the ice glow which seemed to be forever and futilely seeking to blot it out. By the time the rather vague concept of reincarnation the peoples of Karis favored had coalesced, and for that also the river became a symbol, as something set afloat upon the Yeskienis' waters would eventually find shore elsewhere, so might the returning spirit, unless it were weighted or dragged down. It is interesting that Elof is not made by the chroniclers to endorse that, as one might expect, but to declare his ignorance of it. Evidently they wish to stress that within this world, even the powers have bounds, for better or for worse. 
Smithcraft. In the Chronicles, the nature of Elof Smithcraft is discussed and debated at every turn as to whether it was an attribute of a human or a power. But this, these present, present accounts could hardly reflect without revealing more than Elof himself knew at the time. The conclusion come to is the one that Elof suggests in passing, that all smithcraft and humanity was a gift of the powers, a counterbalance to what they knew its foes would one day hurl against it. Whether or not the gift was reclaimed or exhausted, or simply lies dormant for want of knowledge to awaken it, cannot be said. But Elof's case is clear. Those who came before him had been more than human, and that was their glory, and all too often, their downfall. So Elof had, by the very nature of his mission, to be no more than human if he was to succeed. So though the power he had was great, it must have been no more than the most a human might have had, albeit an exceptional one, or, more probably, it was as great as any human might have found within himself, had he only the will to awaken it. It was a great endowment, yet without the dedication to learn its uses and the skills to exploit them, it would have been meaningless. It was in these that Elof's true achievement lay, and in these that his mastery truly surpassed any other of that time. Certainly the materials and processes he used, though mysterious, are not wholly beyond our own comprehension. The mirror shields seem to have been no more than some light and hard alloy, perhaps upon a bracing frame of wood or metal tube. Their chiefest subtlety lay in their shape, which caught and concentrated the sun so well, and in the truly mysterious influence that held them in such unison, both as shield wall and as solar mirror. Such tight coordination and focusing is a problem which bedevils modern solar furnaces. They are capable of astonishing temperatures, such as the power of the sun sheds upon us, but are very clumsy at concentrating it. Nevertheless, there is evidence that some part of this problem was solved in ancient times. The Greek philosopher Archimedes, among the defenses he created for his home city of Syracuse, is said to have fired enemy ships by just such a burning glass, a feat historians have long sneered at because of the problems such mirrors involve. But recently a more practical archaeologist realized that he might have used the long Greek shields, highly polished, and tried an experiment with some 20 modern replicas of these, representing quite a good-sized area of reflector. Under the noon sun, their combined beams were well able to set afire the timbers of a boat moored in the harbor. Elof's shields represented a surface thousands of times greater, and much more carefully and uniformly shaped. In such greater numbers, and more skillfully shaped, and with their beams concentrated by the master shields into near-perfect intensity, they might have achieved astonishing temperatures. It is ironic that the ISIS ultimate plan was to raise the world's albedo, and so reflect away the life-giving solar energy, for Elof simply reflected it back at them. That fine fiber, of which both Gorthar and his wings were shaped, is rather more mysterious to our eyes. Yet, essentially, it was almost certainly more refinement of carbon, or graphite fibers, many varieties of which we can produce under a very great and sustained heat. And of such a heat in his day, some kinds of lava flow would have been an adequate source. Such fibers depend for their remarkable properties upon their crystalline structure, and the ability that Duergar taught him to study this under heat must have given him wide control over them. This, incidentally, 
the Chronicles speak of as if it was a natural ability. But more probably he made use of some device, and his own subtlety lay in the true interpreting of it. For in this, as in all else, he was as he wished his friends to think him, a man only. Such signposts as he left himself, all those generations past, would have been meaningless as his power without the will and daring to exploit them, and the sheer disregard of himself. Had he not shed his old life willingly, it is likely his labors, and most of all those in the furnace, would have curtailed it, or at any rate brought on him a miserable and suffering old age. But the greater flame that burned within him spared him that. The Duergar in the Book of the Sword, some brief glimpses remain of the Duergar people at what, in these latter years, was very probably their peak. In the Book of the Helm, their decline and disappearance is hinted at, and in the Book of the Armoring, its progress is seen. They were undoubtedly a very ancient folk, and equally a very strange one by the standards of ordinary men. To grasp something of how alien they were, one needed only consider a race, a race who were aware of many of the possibilities of science and technology, up to and including some grasp of the structure of matter and the potential energies it could unleash, yet who chose not to pursue or exploit that knowledge. Neither their dwelling underground, nor their characteristic physical shape can set them further apart from men than that. For they were enough like us to interbreed, and they had not always dwelt beneath the earth, some of them could understand men, and even become friends with them and more, as has been seen. In the end, as the world changed about them, many united with men, and brought with them their many virtues. But these were always a small minority. Ildrian, as he has shown to us, is much more characteristic of the majority of Duergar, a cold and remote personality, with his concept of ethics governed by payment and return, even in a forced bargain. Elof's assessment of him shows how well he understood these people, for reasons that he could not have realized at that time. It is ironic that, when he first sought their help, he was himself, without knowing it, demanding a quid pro quo. For it was to the power he had once been that the whole race owed its very survival. The Beginnings of the Duergar Some words of Ilse's, which are not included in the tale, throw a grim light upon this. They were spoken in royal council, to support Kermorvan's plan to aid Karis, and promise the Duergar's aid. We should act, and act in time, for once before we have stood here, and failed to, and it was almost the end of us. Not for nothing do you call us the Elder Folk, for all that you are, we once were, all and more. Once we too had spread out across the world, had explored the nature, the secrets of nature to their depths, only to find what gulfs lay beyond them. We too dreamed ourselves rulers of the world, not brief tenants of another's halls. Then the ice came. Then that earlier long winter rolled over us and scoured away all that we had built. Had Ilmarinen not helped us, shaped us our refuges beneath the, the hollow hills, and taught us new ways to live and to survive, then we should have been altogether destroyed. We were neither as numerous nor as aggressive as you humans. We were not so ready to rip the whole wide world apart and tack it back together again to suit us. We might have been driven back to savagery, and if both your race and mine do not act for themselves now, 
we may yet be. One alone came to help us when it seemed that all other doors were shut, and many hope he will again, but I fear even his face is turned from us now. This was not so, for Elof himself sat by her as she spoke those words, as she afterwards recalled. But she was right, in that he had no intention of maintaining the Duergar in the state he had left them, even had he had the power to do so. As he himself had suggested in his plea to the old king Anvar, Ilmarnan had saved them for a purpose, that the riches of their culture might not wholly vanish from the world, that they might serve as a bridge and an inspiration to struggling future generations, just as he promised Kermorvan he should. To that end, he had sought almost to store them underground, in an environment and a way of life that was relatively fixed, hoping that when the winter was spent and the ice withdrew, they would emerge and join the new men coming into their lands and teach them their ancient wisdom. To some extent, his plan worked. As Ill suggested, many of the greatest works of the men of the Elder Days were created with advice, at least, from the Duergar. The Highgate, for example, would not have been possible without their skill with stone. Even in less happy days, men might, from time to time, awake their interest or their compassion. which was greater than might have been expected, and learn from them again. So it was with the master smith, and so also Elof himself, though it may ha have counted for much with the more obdurate of them that he had saved many of their people's lives, and had only his own and one other in return, for on such petty balances their ethics might rest. They could be generous with their gifts, if they took to a human, and undoubtedly he learned much from them, even more than smithcraft, either directly or from what the master smith had gleaned. His skill in navigation came from them, and more arcane knowledge, often of a quite startling extent. The account of the reasoning by which he grasped Lohi's intention to use the volcanoes of Karis and perhaps of the wetlands before that, is notable because it suggests that he had some knowledge of the existence of continental platforms, the so-called plates. But equally, he seemed not to have understood anything of their movement and interaction, or any of the processes with which modern plate tectonics is concerned. Most probably, therefore, his knowledge was second-hand, and not a result of his own deductions. There is nowhere else he could have come by it save from the Duergar, and it is more likely his fault than theirs that he did not grasp the full concept. And indeed, such drift would be a hard thing to grasp in a world half-shelled in ice, but the Duergar remembered it differently. But a certain amount of teaching and advice was as much uh, as the Duergar would ever give in the years before his coming, and these were exceptions. Even in their best relations with men, they would rarely do more than dwell among them for a brief while, then return with relief to their own. Ultimately, Ilmarnan's plan proved a failure because, no doubt, much as he loved the race he had made the Duergar, he understood them little better than their human cousins. The elder folk, buffeted by climate and destiny, had come to despise the outside world, and grown contemplative and inward-looking, suspicious even of their own kin from elsewhere. They forgot their purpose, or scorned it, and for the most part an enmity grew up between them and the men that they made little effort to avoid. Instead, they fled, shunning the animals as they deemed them, 
and joined their kin in scattered halls elsewhere. In the end, as Anvar told, they fled halfway round the world to escape mankind. But they could not flee forever. Man was their destiny, and with him they were doomed to mingle, or perish in their own isolation. Yet that bleak end was what many at last preferred, and it is doubtful whether any of that race yet walked the world. Yet some did join with men, and their influence was a good one, for it is known that members of that race, which was born of their mingling, sank to the simplest savagery ere they rose again. But what little we have of them speaks well. Even their crude stone tools were fairly made, and they buried their dead with care, and filled the graves with flowers. The Duergar Languages In earlier books of the Chronicles, mention is made of the sound of the Duergar tongue, or tongues, for there were several, but few attempts were made to reproduce any of them. The Book of the Armoring has more than the others that concern Eloth, and that only a few scattered words and phrases, clumsily translated. Even these survive from a single text, probably the oldest surviving. In later copies, they were omitted altogether. This probably indicates the reason. The tongues in which the Chronicles were written were preserved long after they fell from use, first as a classical tongue of refined expression, and later as a mystery language, guarding secrets only for the initiate. But the Duergar languages no man of later age, ages knew. Even those Duergar who, in the general changing of the world, chose to throw in their lot with men, never taught them any Duergar tongue lest it compromise the safety of their kin who remained apart. For this reason, little can be made of what is left. The original author had no alternative but to transcribe it phonetically, using whatever ideographic character sounded approximately right. And it must be remembered that each character in itself also stood for a word. The effect of this may be gauged by comparing the pseudonym a Japanese writer borrowed from his favorite Western author, Itogawa Rampo, to the original. He was referring to Edgar Allan Poe. What an immense span of time could do to this, in which characters and sound forms changed and mistakes and improvements were introduced into the copying, is best left to the imagination. So, to the later copyists, whatever Duergar words were included must have seemed like meaningless gibberish. Sooner or later, they were bound to be edited out. From what little remains, as has been said before, some deductions have been made. One or two words suggest some ancestral affinity with the rather unusual finno ugric family of languages but this cannot be proven. It seems to have sounded much more like a Slavic tongue, however, and for that reason it has been rendered into a Slavic form. Attempts have been made to make the meaning of what is spoken clear from the accompanying dialogue, though it should be noted that Id Ildrian's final comment appears to be moderately obscene. The Duergar were never known for primness, and there are signs that some of Ilse's more pungent comments have been censored by later generations. If so, most unfairly, as she was renowned even among her own folk for the imaginative nature of her insults. In most cases where a human being was present, of course, Duergar would speak the northern tongue. This was partly for reasons of secrecy, but also because they found it a very convenient lingua franca between themselves. Which of their languages took precedence could often have some social or political significance, and was hard to settle. The human tongue, 
which they found easy to master, avoided the question neatly. Why it was Svarhof they spoke is uncertain. Ills, who spoke both Svarhof and Penrutia, claimed it was because the furry northern speech sat more easily in their mouths than the southern, which she thought sounded slimy. This may well have been so, but it may have been adopted simply because Duergar tended to prefer the same slightly cooler climates of the Svarhof, and so come into contact with them more often. By Elof's time, almost all Duergar spoke some Svarhoth, even their names, though they originated in their own tongues, they habitually rendered into northern form, and only in that form are they preserved. The Ekwesh Peoples The various books of the Winter Chronicles contain much incidental lore concerning these savage folk but the Book of the Armoring most of all, probably because it tells of the first encounter with the ravens. For that reason, it is best gathered here. As with the Duergar, examples of their speech are preserved in the oldest texts only, and no doubt for the same reasons. The Ekwesh Tongues It is known that there were many of these, three at least, that were naturally closely related, but not always mutually understandable because they had so many dialects. The majority tongue, like Mandarin Chinese, became almost universally spoken, but jealousies between tribes and clans ensured that it did not oust their own tongues. It became almost a point of honor to speak it or any foreign speech as badly and curtly as possible. The result was that most Ekwesh sounded crude and monosyllabic to outsiders. The ravens, however, spoke the majority tongue as their own, in a particularly old-fashioned form, much like the one Elof had learned a little of from the master smith. It may have flattered the raven chieftain to hear him speak it. None, however, had any written form. A few Ekwesh could read and write the Karasborn languages, but this was not an achievement highly regarded, even when it proved useful. It was, after all, something regarded, even when it proved useful. It was, after all, something thralls could do. Even the shamans and chieftains preserved their lore orally, reinforced only by a mnemonic system patterns of odd characters that operated as a more sophisticated equivalent of the Inca Huipu, or medievally tally sticks. Totally unintelligible when its sphere of reference was unknown. It is thought that this was forced upon them by the ice to keep them dependent on it for dribs and drabs of knowledge, which could be handed out over and over again as some new gift and also, very probably, to prevent any true culture from developing. For this reason, even in the oldest texts of the Chronicles, only a few words of Ekwesh are preserved, spelt much as they sounded to Svarhoth or Penruthia speakers. And since we cannot tell from an ideographic system exactly how the, those tongues sounded, the Ekwesh speech is well and truly lost. It appears to have been an agglutinative type, highly expressive but cumbersome and fiendishly complicated to those who had not grown up with it. The whole phrase, vault out of a boat, became a single verb, out of a boat with one hand to leap, as it might in many primitive languages today for example, certain Inuit and Northwest Coast languages. Such words as can be salvaged have been included in the text, but they amount at best to an informed guess. The Ekwesh Realm and its Origins Much information about the land and history of the Ekwesh peoples is put by the chroniclers into the mouth of their chieftain, speaking with Elof more certainly than he would ever have told a prisoner, 
even one he had come to respect. But this is a common enough device in such histories, and it was undoubtedly from the ravens that most such lore came. Of their homeland, in particular, no outsider left any account. It is not hard to guess why. It is known to have lain in the lands far east of Karis, separated from it by a land so trackless and wild that the ice actually became the safest means for the Ekwesh to cross, and to have reached the furthest shores of the oceans that lapped upon the westlands of Bryhain, where Elof and Kermorvan grew up. Its exact extent is unknown, but undoubtedly it covered more actual land than any other realm among men at that time, perhaps more than all the rest put together. But so miserable and barren was most of this land, barely able to sustain life, that population densities were very low. The Ekwesh people arose as hardy hunter-gatherers with only the simplest of cultures, living a nomadic, seasonal existence, and making the best of the savage and hostile environment, which was all they knew. At this stage, they seem to have lived not unlike the natives of Tierra del Fuego, who astonished European explorers by their ability to live more or less naked, with only crude shelters of branches and grass, within five degrees of the southern polar ice pack. The Ekwesh lands also lay in the proximity of the ice, and it dominated their climate, adding to the long and terrible winters it sent the brief, fierce summer that was natural to the, area, to the region. Each season brought extremes, from heavy snow, to floods, to drought, to torrential rains and snow again, in a ruthless cycle. So bleak was their land that it was a marvel these ancestors of the Ekwesh survived. With only a little more effort, the ice might well have exterminated them entirely, as it sought to do to all other races of men. Why, then, did it fail to? There is some suggestion that the Ekwesh land was a reservation created by the ice, or, more properly, an arena. By pushing the lands to the limits of habitability, therefore, they sought to create a breed of men apt to their ways. Whether this is so, or whether some, pe some among the powers of the ice simply seized upon what they found, the fact remains they soon began to take an active part in the shaping of the Ekwesh folk. Formerly, they had relied for warriors upon the lesser powers among their own numbers, forcing them into strange and fearsome forms, and upon lesser creatures they had bred and deformed into monsters, and only secondarily upon men. They had recruited such renegades as can always be found, individuals or tribes, but these proved rare and highly undependable, and often at a crucial moment chose the kinship of their true kind. For even in the worst among men, some small spark may not be wholly extinguished. So after a series of formidable defeats, not least those inflicted by Karis in the days of its first grandeur, they seem to have concluded that only men could defeat men, and sought to reshape these troublesome creatures to their own ideas. And perhaps their own preconceptions. The Cult of the Ice Undoubtedly, these rebel powers saw men as substantially base, brutish, and vicious. And this judgment may have been reinforced by the urges which came to bedevil them whenever they assumed human form, and which they had never learned to control. So they began to force these strong but unformed folk, whose society already had all the savagery and ruthlessness necessary to hunters who must kill to live, into a society that, so they thought, would best express the, the, this human baseness and channel it in ways useful to them. 
In subtle ways, they began to take hold of the ancestors of the Akwesh and to lead them along the paths they chose. These were often very dark, for it was among the depths of the human mind that the ice sought its hold, and among the blacker desires and pleasures of men. Perhaps it amused those cold minds to dominate those they despised by what harmed them most, by unleashing their own worst urges, by cruelty and torture and the bonds that bind those who have done a thing unthinkable to others. The Ekwesh, under the tutelage of the ice, became a folk bloody and fell, to whom the causing of pain and the shedding of blood were not an evil, not even a means to an end, but an end in themselves. A propitation to be offered and a pleasure to be shared. From Elof's intimacy with the master smith, we know that it enforced austerities upon its highest initiates, no doubt, as the chronicler suggests, to direct their energy and avoid distractions and fearsome journeys into the heart of the ice to commune there with its rulers, which must have involved the initiate forcing himself to survive in an environment that made little or no concession to the human body. The lives of the hidden clan lost in its march eastward over the ice to, Mor to Morvanic were simply what it expected of dedicated men. From Brihon's revelations, we know that self-torment or even mutilation was demanded of them, and from accounts of Ekwesh captives and grisly discoveries aboard their ships and in their camps, we know that it demanded human torture and sacrifice from its followers. But of the actual rites of its worship, we know only the most general details, mostly from thralls who were fortunate enough to see them and survive to be freed. As was mentioned in earlier appendices, the shamans relied on ecstatic and visionary rites, dancing themselves into a frenzy to drumbeats to release their inner powers. This appears to have been a cruder analog to the concentration and labor of smithcraft, and its effects, naturally, were more transient. This their followers appeared to have imitated, but to what end, and in what ways, is unknown. Unless, perhaps, we may see some distant reflection of them in the many strange rites of veneration and fear still associated with glaciers, such as those practiced in a thinly Christian guise by native South Americans across a wide range of the Andes in the Choleridi Festival. In this, the participants, the so-called Ukuku dancers, wear bear masks, carrying a great cross. They climb up to the glaciers that loom over their mountain homes, and there spend a night above the snow line in a vigil initiated by a symbolic whipping. This is intended to propitiate the Condenados, school spirits, now said to be those of the damned, who are supposed to inhabit the glacier and protect the festival pilgrims from them. In the morning, they use their whips as saws to cut out huge lumps of the glacier, and these they carry as a penance down to the festival sanctuary, in a procession accompanied by the pilgrims with wild hooting cries. This ritual destruction of the glacier is thought to enact the penance of the condenados, and release both them and their intended victims. In this, and many other examples, some relic of the dominion and terror of the ice may yet remain. The Ekwesh Empire In fact, of course, human beings are neither so simple nor so easily coerced, whatever the ice may have believed. Even under that yoke, at its worst, the Ekwesh kept many natural human virtues the ice could not suppress. These it had to contain by channeling them inwards, 
love was limited to the closest of kindred only, and became a fierce and jealous thing. That many times led to a slaying when it was in any way balked or betrayed. Man and wife, father and children, were linked by a bond whose very strength and rigidity made it perilous. Loyalty and respect extended only to the tribe, and no further. Intermarriage was possible, but the wife was seldom well regarded, nor, sometimes, children. Those outside the family could command no affection. Those outside the tribe might be foes or allies, but never friends. Those who were not equesh were only potential victims or thralls, and thralls were scarcely human. An equesh might father children upon a thrall woman, but those children would be marked thralls and so also their children's children, to the end of their line, even if all the fathers were Equesh, and the blood be almost pure. An Equesh woman conceived by a thrall, if something so unthinkable were to happen, would be slaughtered out of hand, and her child with her, by her closest kin, as being unfit even for sacrifice. Yet even in this harsh society, individual Equesh still retained surprising depths. Some families, especially among the ravens, had a tradition of treating their thralls humanely, and though this earned them the contempt of others, it often gained them greater labor, and so greater riches. For slaves have little to gain by working harder, but though but these wished their master to prosper, if only for their own protection. So such masters often became rich and powerful, and some slight force for better ways. However, there were stronger voices set against them, for the ice had chosen its chief spokesman with cunning. These were the shamans, the wise men of the tribes, from the earliest days it had recruited them and trained them in its cult, arming them with arcane knowledge and teaching them to enhance and develop the innate power that men of Karis called smithcraft, but which the ice claimed was its gift. From their association with the ice, they derived great prestige and authority, and from presiding over the atrocious rites it prescribed. Often, they became the true rulers behind the tribal chiefs, who became merely war leaders. But sometimes they became chieftains themselves. The one whom Elof first encountered in Asenby seems to have been of this breed, as also their younger captor in Morvanic. It was under the influence of the earliest and most charismatic of these leaders men trained by the ice powers, or even the powers themselves in human form, that the most savage tribes in the north of the land first began to link up, sometimes by alliance, most often by conquest. They gathered into a few large, very large tribes under the name totem of whichever group had made itself dominant. The strength of unity gave them greater mastery over their land, and their numbers began to increase rapidly. Soon they were outstripping the land's ability to support them, and under the pressure of the ice and the goading of necessity, they began to raid their most southerly neighbors to live, and at last pressed down into their land. So the pattern of the Equesh expansion grow, raid, and then settle to grow again was set in motion and for a thousand years it did not change. The same process drove them over the seas to the Westlands, and over land to Karis. Some of these southern tribes had abandoned a nomadic existence, and developed the beginnings of agriculture, and the Equesh were not slow to see that this was a surer way of gaining food, but opposed a problem. To them, 
hunting and warfare were proper occupations for men, and the practice of crafts. Gathering was women's work, at best, and the drudgery of cultivation inconceivably demeaning, not to say impossible for a nomad. So perhaps, with guidance from the ice, their attitude began to change. Instead of butchering their adversaries outright, they made thralls of them and set them to produce food. They themselves remained semi-nomadic and developed that mode of life to great heights. They moved as overlords between these communities of thralls, cessors, still nomadic and free. They would oversee uh, planting and return to oversee the harvest, leaving the thralls to cultivate the land meanwhile, knowing that if they slacked or failed their masters would consume their own food, and perhaps them also. Though unusual, this society was recognizable, if more extreme version of the periodic taxing rounds levied by the Rus of Kiev or the Norwegian Vikings upon the Slav towns of the interior, as described by the warrior Otter, Otter, who visited the court of Alfred the Great. The Ekwesh, however, carried it further, extending the same principle to mines and shipyards, and even small manufactories and market towns. The thralls became less a mercantile subclass, but always at the mercenary of their fundamentally less civilized overlords. Any development more advanced, however, was always held back by the Ekwesh's understandable fear of giving thralls too much power, as the Spartans feared the Helots. And this goes some ways as Karis or Morvanic, or even more or even rural Nordany. To them, they represented what might happen when thralls got out of hand, and were to be subjugated as soon as possible lest they set their own thralls a bad example. Any awe or impression civilization might have made upon them, that fear, encouraged no doubt by the ice, swallowed up. Up to that point, however, the Ekwesh prospered, Surpluses created increased their population still further, and redoubled their need to expand. By now, many of their remaining neighbors, who were mostly along the eastern seaboard, saw what was coming and fled overseas, or even, in desperation, over the ice. These were the hapless fugitives who poured into Nordney only a brief time after the Svarhoth fugitives from Morven and made common cause with them. Those who did not flee were swiftly overwhelmed. <clears throat> but as the Ekwesh ran out of land and neighbors to, con to conquer, they ran into their first serious check, and it was one of the Isis' own making. It had bred to Ekwesh to be its conquerors, spreading savagery over the other realms of men. But for them to expand into those realms, they had to achieve some degree of unity, some semblance of empire, or organize their armies. And it was precisely those aspects of human nature which made unity possible that the ice had suppressed. The tribes had always fought one another, making and breaking alliances as the moment's advantage dictated. But for centuries it had been chiefly their thralls who had suffered, and that too drove the Ekwesh outwards. A defeated tribe would lose some possessions, then seek to conquer some more. But now, with none left to conquer, save far off over unknown lands and seas, they were beginning to turn on each other in savage earnest. The ties of common kinship had been made too slack to restrain them. The ice had to tighten its grip somehow, and forced unity upon them, and to do so, it sought to rely upon the influence it had long wielded over men, the sheer superstitious awe it could evoke. The Hidden Clan The Hidden Clan, therefore, which came into being around this time, seems to have been wholly a development of the ice.
a secret blood brotherhood of chosen shamans and shaman chieftains from all the tribes, in which the bonds established through elaborate ordeal and ceremonial, and reinforced by shared purpose, overrode the limited interests of individual tribes. In this, it somewhat resembled the intertribal Freemasonry practiced among the Australian Aborigines, being signified by elaborate patterns of citrusy scars, but in a much more organized form, and wholly sinister in its practices and aspirations. At first, as its name suggests, it had to remain secret, so strong was the intertribal distrust. Many members were lynched outright by their own followers. But as time passed and the benefits of some degree, at least, of coordination between tribes became clearer to the ordinary clansmen, membership commanded first tolerance and then respect and fear. Many initiates came to display or even to vaunt their status as a point of pride by negative means such as bearing an abstract pattern, perhaps with an arcane meaning, instead of their totem. Lesser men began to copy them, and such secret societies grew up at a lower level between the tribes, but without seriously affecting the barriers between them. When there was conflict, tribes still told over society almost every time. It was the hidden clan that organized the armies that crossed the ice to begin the centuries of campaign against Karis, and a century or two later developed the arts of shipbuilding and sailing that sent the black ships raiding over sea on the trail blazed by the fugitives to assail the westlands of Kerberhain and Nordney. These were achievements, but they were slow in coming, many times hindered by intertribal jealousy and strife even within the clan itself. Some lesser clans, of which the ravens were the most significant, distrusted its domination by the larger tribes and held aloof. The hidden clan and its imitators were an imperfect means to an end, and the ice was forever in search of something better. But none came until the master smith Milio appeared on the scene. The Master Smith's Design Over the centuries, the ice had seduced a number of men to its side, including smiths of greater power than he, but never before such a scholar. His fanatical energy drove him to acquire the greatest library of any man living at his time, to seek ancient knowledge among the Duergar and among the Equesh themselves at his continual peril. This he found, as the Book of the Sword recounts, chiefly from observation and study of the subtle ways in which the shamans had refined the magecraft taught them by the ice to help them control their folk. He synthesized this knowledge with others, as the shamans could not do, and he applied it to the human minds with a finesse the ice could never match. So he conceived the mind sword, and so, equally, his inability to forge such a thing. He sought one who could do the work for him, leaving only the last and simplest for him to complete. But when he tricked Elof into doing so, he was startled by the boy's ability to complete it, and even more so by the power of the result. With such a force in his hands, he set out to second-guess his masters, and rather than turning the sword over to Lohi, leaving him no more than a useful appendage, to unite the Equesh under his own leadership, making him indispensable. Almost certainly he hoped to gain status among the powers, even to be made one of them, for such promises they often made to their useful dopes producing images of the dead as proof. If so, it was a deluding hope, for they were only the mindless shades of Tawun, constructs of memories with no controlling intelligence at their heart save the rebel powers.
but those who wished to believe were easy to delude, and the master smith undoubtedly won great status by uniting the Equesh. Lohi may have meant to keep him alive, at least, or to bring him more securely under her domination. The changes in him, that eerie bleaching, may have been caused by some spiritual exhaustion of his powers in Lohi's service. But equally, they may have been intended to change his body, to fit him for life in a cold environment as Tapayao altered man for the forests. For there are living things even today that may survive in such conditions. Ice fish, for example, that live in freezing water, by having no hemoglobin in their blood, and they have just that white and pallid look. He had undoubtedly earned some reward, if reward this was, for it was he who, the old chieftain told Elof and Kermorvan, first united the tribes into a single, solid fighting force. And, ironically, it was an achievement that his death only reinforced. When Elof destroyed him and the mind sword together, the sudden slackening of the sword's hold on their minds, added to the sheer shock of seeing one they had thought a demigod slain and cast down, caused the Equesh to flee in panic. But such was the humiliation of this, that for the first time, it gave the tribes a common cause strong enough to outweigh their mutual mistrust, the more so as Lohi played upon it. When less than two years later, the elite troops of the Hidden Clan, to a man, chieftains, and shamans' sons from many tribes, were wiped out in Morvanic. She had no trouble in bringing them together at last. Even the ravens, who still scorned the Hidden Clan, and had never shared in the assaults on the Westlands, or the madness of the Mind Sword, joined in the oaths to avenge the defeat. And without the witness of Raven himself, even Elof probably could not have swayed them. With Kar to set their hearts ablaze with battle fury, the Equesh were in Lohi's grip as much as they had ever been in the Master Smiths. And when that grip broke, many a mind and heart among them shattered with it, and the old hierarchy of the tribes was broken forever. The Aftermath In the time that followed, the fate of the Equesh became joined once again to that of other men. The ravens became more humane as the influence of the ice over them dwindled, but they kept much of their stern pride and gathered the other Equesh who joined them under their sway. They posed Kermorvan something of a problem in settling them among his own folk, but to him and his line they remained fiercely loyal and never forgot that allegiance. As the generations passed, they mingled increasingly with their ancient foes, and in particular with the northerners who resembled them. But their blood was always the hardiest and best suited to life in the increasingly harsh conditions of the declining land. They came to dominate it, until it was in the end wrestled from them, with cruelties as great as any the Equesh practiced. But that, alas, is the way of men, in which the ice was not wholly mistaken. In the areas of the land they settled longest, some echoes of that terrible time may still linger, for there it is said of some tribes that they once earned a dark name among their neighbors. Peaceful hunter-gatherers and fishers for the most part, for dark practiced grim pride, fell magic, the taking of thralls and the eating of man's flesh. Today there is so little evidence of this that it has been disputed, and it may be that such tales are simply an, an ancestral memory, harking back to times more remote than any can now imagine. In their own homeland, so far as can be told, their empire fragmented and fell apart far more swiftly, for most of those who had held it together perished in the Battle of the Gate, or subsequently. Every major clan was shorn of at least half its leaders, 
generally the more energetic and fanatical ones, and its most accomplished and dedicated warriors. And from those who remained, the grip of the ice was lifted. At first, perhaps, there was little outward change in their way of life. But as the years passed and new generations arose, and it became clear that the ice was retreating, the old concerns soon lost their force, and the fierce energy waned. The remaining shamans lost much of their power and dominance. Hierarchies of tribe and clan withered, and the barriers between master and thrall softened. Little by little, the realm fragmented as the rising sea swallowed its coasts, and the Ekwesh as a people fragmented with it. Many still sailed over sea to Nordney, but as settlers rather than reavers, and it is from them, through the tenuous links to the east, that the last was heard of the once feared Ekwesh realm. All else was silence. But those lands have since been the cradle of many a formidable and conquering people, whose names have become as great a byword for savagery in their time as the Ekwesh were in theirs. Yet they rarely deserved it quite so thoroughly as did the Ekwesh. And it may be that there also some faint memory of their forgotten ancestors has ridden before them like a ghostly banner, which, perhaps, is the memorial they would have wished. But in a better one may remain elsewhere. Those few stragglers who remained in Karas and were not slaughtered out of hand in the confusion and madness of the early days also came to mingle with their lighter-skinned neighbors. Unmanned and humbled by what they had experienced, they responded much as the ravens had and sought new allegiance. There also they won it with their great skill at surviving in the wild, and more swiftly. Mild as was the winter that followed the fall of the gate, many Karis folk would have perished were it not for their aid. One or two became men of great account in the crude tribal life to which the survivors were reduced, but there were never enough of them for their physical type to dominate as it did in Brace Hall, and the race of the Akia Washa was lost, becoming no more than a name. But when, many thousands of years later, such another tribe of fierce sea rovers arose in those lands, that name was remembered, and either bestowed upon or taken by them in defiant assumption of a heritage. To their earliest enemies, these sea peoples were called Akiyawa or Ekwesh, as our hieroglyphics rendered it. And that is the form we have used. But they are better known to us as the Achaeans, the warlike Greeks of Homer. Flora and Fauna The Book of the Armoring has much to tell of the living things of Karis, for Elof and Rock, having traveled from another continent, often found them very strange. Something is said of the different varieties of tree they saw from the cog on their long river voyage and elsewhere. But since Elof was forced to remain on the island for so long, animals were mostly mentioned in connection with Rock's travels which are not germane to the tale. For the most part, it can be said that the animal life is recognizably similar to that in similar latitudes of Elof's own land at this time. Many, however, are made to sound strange, because they are described only in their modern winter coloration. It may well be that they were wearing it all year round, an anomaly that may, be, that may reflect the worsening state of the climate and perhaps also the more direct effects of the ice on living things. These were markedly more severe than in Brace Hall, because they, their, the mountain ranges were ranged predominantly on north to south axes, and large areas of flat land and forest remained open to migration. In Karis, however, 
most of the mountains extended from east to west, and as the ice advanced, they left few easy avenues southward. The creation of the secondary ice sheets must have worsened matters even further. Adaptation must have been forced upon animals and plants much more swiftly. Small and Domestic Animals Among the commonest small breeds were squirrels, hares, rabbits, lemmings, mustelid predators such as martens and wolverines and foxes, hedgehogs and water shrews flourished on the island and were totally new to Eloth. Mercifully, it was free of rats and mice, though the city of Karas was not. Dogs and wild kites were the main agents for controlling such vermin. The more efficient cat still rare as a domestic animal outside the houses of wealthy noblemen. These were probably unlike modern cats. From their descriptions, they sound more like domesticated breeds derived from some wilder breeds, such as Felis lunensis, ancestor of Felis silvestris, the modern wildcat. Other domesticated breeds included the huge and temperamental cattle of Karis, the same breed Elof had herded as a child, and some much smaller beast which yielded a woolly fleece, but from its description sounds otherwise more like a goat than a sheep. Certainly no very sharp distinction was then drawn between the two caprine types. It may very well have looked a little like the primitive soye sheep, lean and long-limbed with substantial horns, but must have been much larger. Less common were domesticated pigs, savage creatures barely distinguishable from the wild hogs they were bred from. These, and their wild cousins, the wild boars, were still common enough to make hunting worthwhile it was hardly less dangerous than keeping them. Horses were not only ridden, but were the main draft animals of the land. Oxen being stronger, but more dangerous, it seemed strange to Elof that they were none of the hardy little pony-like species native to his own land, with their vestigial extra hooves. Wild Animals among larger wild animals, the various breeds of mammoth were rare, probably through hunting, but still to be found in the northeastern plains of the wildlands. The same was true of some breeds of woolly rhinoceros. Deer and wizened were still quite common, some breeds of the very great size. One deer rock shot was larger, he claimed, even than the huge deer of Tapayao's forests and had a wider spread of antlers. If so, this must almost certainly have been the so-called Irish elk, Megaceros. In the warmer areas, wild cattle of similar enormous bulk still roamed, probably ancestors of the recently extinct aurochs. And there were probably both wild boar and wild hogs in the forests. In the higher areas, chamois were common, and some breed of mountain goats. Large predators seemed to have been rare, probably because the land had been so long settled by men. It is known that the early settlers of Karis faced some big cat of appalling size, probably the so-called cave lion, Felis leo Spelia, a third again as large as modern lions, but this had been quite deliberately hunted down and all but exterminated throughout the land. Some had reappeared in the wildlands, but Elof and Rock ran little risk of encountering them where game was so scarce. Another somewhat smaller cat, probably a descendant of the giant cheetah, Asinex ardinesis, was still an occasional threat to livestock in the Southlands. In the northern woodlands, lynxes were still to be found, and on the grasslands a cat of similar size, probably the step cat, Felis Manuel, wild cats very like today. The bears, as in Elof's land, were very large, 
but chiefly vegetarian and rarely aggressive if not provoked. Wolves, once again, were large but rare, although they had begun to move into the western lands once more as men deserted them and found fat pickings after the battles that raged there. These creatures are mentioned only incidentally among the many strands of the Chronicles, but one or two creatures feature so predominantly that they deserve some further remarks. Amakak This astonishing creature, the Sea Devourer, is so unlike any known sea beast, either in living or fossil form, that it might be thought some strange anomalous form natural to a minor power, as were dragons, or yet another of the creation or distortions of the ice. The strong impression of intelligence it left with Eloth and Rock is echoed by other surviving witnesses and suggests this. Yet manifestly the creature was no servant of the ice, for it destroyed its thralls with appalling ferocity and cunning, yet spared their quarry with an almost regal grace. It has been suggested that it might have been a shape assumed by Nyrad, or some other sea-dwelling power, but this is unlikely. There is no record of them ever containing themselves within a single beast, preferring shoals and throngs such as Tapayel preferred his trees. What then can it have been? It bore the shape of the Plesiorus, long-necked prehistoric sea reptiles, but they were long extinct, much smaller, and lived differently. Nor could two such keen observers ever mistake such creatures for any kind of seal or other pinip head. It seems best to accept their identification, therefore, and look for some other evidence. And this exists. In studying the many sightings of the so-called sea serpents around the world, the Dutch scientist Dr. H. C. Odemans produced a composite picture of a very large marine carnivore resembling a type of sea of a type of seal or otter but by the same evolutionary convergence that made ichthyosaurus appear almost identical to dolphins shaped like a giant plesiosaur he christened it somewhat misleadingly megophius or great serpent though the evidence has been interpreted differently by later researchers most notably by Dr. Bernard Huvelamans of Belgium as two distinct species of different size, the distinctive shape and dimensions remain, and they fit the sea devourer all too well. More, it is generally agreed to inhabit colder northern waters, where it was much feared by seamen of previous generations in their small sailing vessels. This might be thought of as a superstition, but in one or two Norwegian fishing museums, giant iron traps can still be found that were set in fjords to ensnare long and questing necks. In a pre-industrial society, the labors of shaping such a trap is not usually devoted to hunting phantoms. It may be worth noting that quite startling intelligence often displayed by sea mammals, not only dolphins and whales, but also seals such as H.G. Harrell's Atlanta, able to distinguish command words spoken in complex context in a normally toned voice, a feat unusual in any creature. And it is not impossible that with an increased brain size, this might also be enhanced which is not to say that such intelligence would produce anything like a human mind. What use would a human outlook be in so different a body and lifestyle? But even a very different mind might well be able to share the same repugnance for the common enemy of all things living and recognize a call for help, 
not least from so powerful a mind as Elos. Small Mammoth The miniature Probosidians with whom Elof and Rock share Elon Gorinhayans might sound even more problematic than the sea devourer. But in fact, the existence of such creatures during the long winter is well established. Like similarly dwarfed deer, hippopotami, and ground sloths at various times, they seem to have evolved in island environments where food and living space were limited. Various, very different breeds existed in different parts of the world, but the most likely candidate would be Loxodonta falconeri, or a close relative. This was in fact a true elephant, rather than a mammoth or a mastodon, with long, straight tusks, and it stood no more than three feet tall. If it was as curious as its living relatives, it might well have strayed into the smithy in search of food. Swans The guise of a great black swan, though undoubtedly it reflected something in Kara's nature, may not have been so strange and eerie as it appears. It may have been a shape well adapted to passing unnoticed through the skies of Karis, and perhaps of other lands also. The only living black swan is confined to a small space of the southern hemisphere, is smaller than some northern breeds and has a slightly comical squeaky cry. But during the long winter, a swan of immense size undoubtedly lived in the Northlands. Fossil evidence suggests that it was among the largest of flying birds, but can tell us no more. Of the hue of its feathers, no trace remains. Trees and Plants the impression gained from Elof's journey and from the map of Karis may be somewhat deceptive. The text of the Chronicle tells a truer story. There were still large areas of wooded land in the Vale of Karis, both north and south, but they were sadly reduced from what they had once been and accounted for a relatively small land area. Much of what remained was merely secondary growth where the old established forests had been cut down, sometimes even a stunted aftergrowth of little use to men and fit only for the smaller beasts. Papayo's accusation was quite justified. Karis had played the spendthrift with its woodlands, as with every other resource it tapped. This was less true in those that were predominantly Svarhoth, both because they were better foresters and because they had a much smaller population and agriculture. Along the snow line near the gates of the Duergar birch forest still persisted, with dwarf juniper and alpine alders and barrens, and scrubland of heather and gorse. In the wildlands, species related to all the common evergreen trees of Elof's homeland could be found, save for the redwoods he loved so much. The same was true of deciduous trees, though, as he noticed, they tended to be smaller. Pines, from the descriptions, Scots pines, spruce and firs, beech, and oaks were the commonest trees there, and in the south, sweet chestnut, which was new to him. The Svarhoth had been fond of these, and planted them throughout the forests. Most of these were also found within the warmer climes of the Vale itself, along with less familiar species such as plains, cypresses, cork oaks, tamarisks, and even some fig cactuses and date palms spread from the southern shore, though in the north they were non-fruiting. Beyond Karis itself, in the warmer east, cypress and olive trees were commonest, and along the coasts, maritime, and alpo pines. There were some of these on Elon Gorenhayen 
among a uh, characteristically fragrant scrubland that seems to have been chiefly the evergreen shrub known today as the rock rose, cistus, mingled with broom and gorse, and perhaps also laurel. Ships Less can be said of the types of ships with which the book deals. The huge ships that Cremorvan built with the aid of the Duergar, and the cogs which were the main model in use on the rivers of Caris, than of earlier ones, because no reliable marginalia survive. Evidently, such large ships fell quite swiftly from use as the land declined, and later copyists had never seen them. Their attempts to draw them are fanciful in the extreme. Large warships such as the Prince Quarantine seem to have had hulls of a very modern profile, and a system of multiple sails such as the larger rivercraft of the Duergar used. The Dromans have been given the, that name to distinguish them because they seem to have been simply larger versions of the standard double-ended Kerberhine model, though with a variety of more complex rigs. As the extent to which he kept his smiths and shipwrights busy suggests, Kermorvan was constantly experimenting to improve the performance of his ships. What heights he may have eventually reached are suggested by the cutter that bore Rock and Elof across the ocean. If he was able to develop fore and aft rigs sufficiently to apply them to his larger and leaner hulls, he could have achieved craft almost as fast and efficient as the great China clippers. The cog could hardly be more of a contrast. It is given that name because it somewhat resembled the breed of craft that was common on the seas of medieval Europe. A round-bellied ton of a ship, well suited to carrying heavy loads or companies of troops, with equal seaworthiness and ill grace under a simple square sail, with at most a smaller topsail. Inversions made or adapted for fighting, as was Trikgar's, Towers of planking were added at bow and stern to give archers height to fire down onto an opposing deck. In his boat, and probably in most others of his land, these were kept to a sensible height. But in an earlier breed of arms race, the European types were raised higher and higher till they often made the ship dangerously unstable, more a threat to its crew than its enemies.